not immediately strike any player who braves the perils of Dragon's Dogma or the depths of Bear Black Isle in its Dark Arisen expansion. But in both cases they hold very significant meaning. In the latter we find them embodied strongest in a character we never formally meet. The ancient Arisen known as Arthicus. Our tale of discovery begins as soon as the doors open to the island, and beyond we find the Monument of Remembrance. It is blank at first, but as we plumb the hidden reaches of the various areas, we'll find memories etched in stone that we can then read on the monument. More than half a full ten of the seventeen pages are the memoirs of Arthicus. And so, in trying to understand what happened to this man, we will start with these records he left us. In the first, we find out that he has already spent at least a year on Birblak Island. He doesn't mention anyone else, only the occasional voices he seems to hear in his head. This prompts him to keep the journal in order to keep his thoughts clear. The second is written an undetermined amount of time later, but the game lore suggests it could be decades or even centuries. He tells of how he has met many others, and how he sought their company and to join them. However, they always refuse and Arthicus feel more hurt and isolated with every rejection. Years or decades later, in the third, he tells of meeting an Arisen who openly attacked him. In the fourth, he writes of meeting a headstrong young woman, barely more than a child, who sought items of great power and still refused his offer of aid. The fifth page shows his revelation that everyone he meets has been an Arisen. And come the sixth, we find the sinister truth. Arthacus is still hearing voices in his head. We also learn he has lost his pawn, but no time frame to guess when. Pages 7 and 8 seem to come quicker as he complains of the voice drowning out his own thoughts and driving him to forgetfulness. Yet for the complaining he is finding it harder to be concerned. He starts finding solace, even as his very purpose is slowly forgotten. Until his only real memory of that purpose is that he ever had one. In the ninth page he seems to have found some conviction. Somehow he has come to the conclusion that his duty is to sacrifice others to his dragon. Then page 10 jumps off the deep end as he commits to reaping those who enter the island. What does this tell us about Arthacus? Among other things, he is quite ancient. There can be decades or centuries between dragons choosing an arisen. And so it's entirely possible that his ten scant remembrances span hundreds of years, maybe even more than a thousand. And we learn that as time goes on, he hears voices in his head. Isolation and extreme rejection give him little more to do than hear it as he seeks for an exit that he never finds. And we also find out that he becomes a murderer. So let's really begin with the obvious question. What are these voices he hears? Conventional mass media wisdom would quickly point the finger at Arthacus being schizophrenic, but there's more to it than that. While it is possible, it's not entirely likely. He exhibits some symptoms and completely goes 180 on others. So what else could it be? The simplest answer is psychosis, for which he meets almost every criteria. Hallucinations or delusions? Check. Hearing voices or paranoia? Check. Thought disorder, repetition of words or difficulty thinking? Check again. The culprit is most likely stress. 
Arthacus wants badly to leave Beta Black Island and wants even more to be around others. He is constantly forced to endure years upon years of loneliness on top of total rejection by everyone he meets. This kind of stress can absolutely bring about a so-called psychotic break over time. Not helping at all are the dead arisen. Those chosen by the dragons for their indomitable will find themselves never truly gone. On normal soil, their very wills would turn their bodies to lesser workin. But on Bir Black Isle, cut off from normal reality, their bodies lie and their wills with them. Their unbending resolve hers to forever spew their final thoughts, wishes and observations into the very minds of those who discover them. Their voices are almost certainly the one Arthur's first hear. He mentions only noticing them occasionally, which is likely him unknowingly happening on a corpse. Over time though, they mingle with his growing psychosis, and some of these past on arisen were quite dark as well. So what became of Arthacus after he succumbed to madness? While there is nothing to directly say it, the most likely scenario, and the ones very strongly suggested, is that he became death. You will barely have your feet in the door of Bitter Black Isle before encountering the Grim Reaper himself. Possessing a skite larger than his body and a hooded cloak filled with endless black of pure nothingness. A creature so immensely that one swing of its blade can fell even the mightiest of creatures. So what exactly do we know about death? On Bir Black Isle, as on Grancis, there are a number of notice boards. On these one can find a series of requests called the Wages of Death. The very first one opens with, to you, traveler from a place and time far distant, bearing the self-same auspice carved upon your breast, I offer these words. It is written by another arisen, in other words, no name given. It speaks to finding an answer, and sharing it with one who passes the given trials. Written apparently by the same person, the second opens with, The more monsters I hunt here, the more uneasy I become. Beneath deepening feelings of despair and resignation, a strange sense of anticipation simmers. An arisen who is lonely, desperate, but starting to look forward to the kill. From the third quest, the important piece comes in the middle. I can ill understand the joy I felt to breathe the deathly stench of the creature. It was not courage or fear, but some aspiration that lie within me. This arisen is losing their sense of self. No conscience drives them. They don't feel a need to kill, they just want to. Finally, the fourth gives us this gem. I have cast away the shackles of the arisen, in form and function. I have embraced my calling as death. Death was himself formerly arisen, just as you. And at the end of it all, you face him yourself. There's two major questions this leaves us with. The first being why would death want you to kill him? And the easiest answer is that he doesn't. Rather, he fully intends to kill you. Every step of the questline brings you against the strongest foes on Bitter Black Isle, teaching you to hunt the way he did, to instill you the love of killing. All to inevitably bring you to him so that he can reap you himself. And here is where we come up with the most likely answer to the second question. Who is death? Arthacus, an arisen who hunts alone, struggling to overcome Bir Black Island's monsters, and who comes to love the hunt and the kill. One who finds his answers in the death of others. One driven mad by the voices of his head, so powerful as to transcend mortality, and manifest himself as death itself. 
so driven by his own inner voices that they manifest audibly around him, a sign that he is near. But why put you through all of that? Let's look back at the Monument of Remembrance first. Specifically page 9, where Arthicus mentions making a sacrifice, not just of 1000 souls, but of sacrificing specifically untainted souls. The wages of death speaks of joy in killing, of hunting, of finding the answers through it. And in the end makes references to death as a self-claimed paragon of perfection. You are being made untainted in his eyes, pure, driven and free. You were conditioned to be made prey by prey. Death made himself a target, so you would practically hunt yourself into his very sights. And from there he puts you to sleep and then you never awaken. Arthicus hunted monsters and became one. He gazed into the abyss and as it gazed back into him, he found it wanting and he fed it. Score one for Nietzsche.